Welcome to Just Blaze the Programming. Today we have a special video. This video is non technical, and also this is just for those who do not know authentication authorization at a basic level. So, if you already know what they are, basically, if you know what a role is, a policy is, and a claim, then you're good to go. You do not need to watch this video, skip it, and go to the uh, uh, the technical video I have up here if it's up there. If it's not up there, I'm still working on it, but don't worry, I'll be, you know, I'll go back and put it up here. Anyways, all of you out there who went did the poll, I saw it, and I see that there's people who would like at least a basic refresher on how all this works, authentication, authorization. At the very minimum, you're going to need to know what these three things are and how they interact with each other. We'll get into the technical aspects in another video, but in here, we're just going to discuss to give you the uh, foundational knowledge you're going to need so you don't get lost when that video comes out. I will explain things in the video as well. It's just that I'm not, I'm probably not going to be going as in depth as I'm going to go here when it comes to teaching you, you know, the basics of how this, uh, how these things work. So if this is you, then please stick around. If you do not know, basically the, the, the thing you should ask yourself is if you know what a role is, a policy is, and a claim is in ASP.NET Core, then you're good. You don't need the video. If you do not know what they are, then I would encourage you to stick around and let's get started. So let's get started. In this case, we're going to be discussing how authentication and authorization works in ASP.NET Core. So in our case, there are other ways of introducing this authentication authorization process, specifically authentication. We could use ASP.NET Core Identity API, or we could use uh, something else like JWT uh, JSON Web Tokens. So we're not going to be going into J uh, JSON Web Tokens for authentication because that's just another scheme. Uh, you can have different schemes in your program. You can actually have uh, all at the same time if you feel like it. But I'm really just going to be focusing on ASP.NET Core Identity API. If you have seen my other um, basic simple authorization and authentication tutorial in Blazor, I was using this. So that is how I was able to create uh, all those tables without me doing much because this basically brings in the template for your authentication authorization. And the only real caveat it has is um, that you have to have a SQL database uh, in order for this to be used. So that is the only real inflexibility about, of it, but otherwise it saves a lot of time. So that's why I want to be discussing ASP.NET Core Identity API, because this is also how I'm going to be implementing authentication authorization in the tech piece that's going to come after this. So uh, if you don't know what JWT is, don't worry. We're not going to get into that, but it's just a token that has information on it for your user. Just think of it that way and you're good to go. And why, the reason why I bring up ASP.NET Core and not just Blazor is because Blazor is not the one that's going to be handling your authentication authorization. Blazor does some other stuff. What you need is this library. ASP.NET Core actually has the authentication authorization um, code, basically, that you need for you to have the identity API. And then from that, you could implement the authentication and authorization you would want in your program. But what is authentication and authorization? So if you don't know what this is, don't worry about it. I was confused for it for a while. But you're basically asking a question. Authentication is essentially asking, do you exist in the system? So that's what a difference between an authorized and a non-authorized user is that the user exists in the system and is recognized. So when you want to log in and your G and your Gmail comes out or whatever, that means you exist in the system. The system recognizes that you have some privileges. What those privileges allow you is the authorization piece. This is what it basically asking another question is, what do you do? What do you have access to? Um, that's the easiest way to think of authentication authorization. They're not that complex of concepts. So this is really all you, you would need to understand these two. When we get into the technical stuff, that's where things can get a little iffy, but don't worry about it. So one of the key features that ASP.NET Core Identity API brings, apart from allowing you know a bunch of templates to the, for you to use off the bat, is that it is separates is uh, authorization piece into uh, three different, uh, authorization, you know, based ways of, um, separating the, the privileges of your code. So the three ways are roles, policies, and claims. Now these are roles. The what I say is based because in the Microsoft doc, it says this is called a, you could have roles based authorization, policy based authorization and claims based authorization. So all this is, so what I'm saying is 
that this is just how we're going to separate the code and our functions depending on the privileges of the user. Every user can have a rule. So uh, if you have whatever users, you know, you probably heard of like an admin, just a normal user, maybe, you know, you're working for HR or something. These are all roles that you might separate your, um, your code in. It doesn't really matter, you know, what the names are. The names are just important to you. But, you know, whatever the functionality of that code is and whatever the roles are, uh, are supposed to have access to, that is something you have to think about. But this is how we separate our code. Then there are policy-based versions, which are basically allow you to have a combination of different factors. You could have roles in here, you could have logic, and you can have um, claims as well within the policy. And this is uh, the policy base is usually how um, I believe is usually the most recommended thing to use for your authorization because it's so flexible. But you still need roles, you still need claims. And what are claims? Our claims. All right, here we go. And claims are probably the most important to understand in all this because this is how we retrieve our roles for our users. We're not going to get into that right now. I'm just going to go into the first three. But to give you an idea, what a claims is, a claims is just a uh, a key uh, a key pair, a key value pair that um, a single user has uh, associated with them. So it's a single user associated. And you can have whatever values you want in that key value pair. The default key value is going to be a role and a name. But you can add other stuff. So you could have even more roles for a claim. So which means that if your user has multiple roles, you could have that going for them as well. But I'll get into this a little bit later. Let's discuss what a role is specifically. So I know that most of you out there have heard, you know, admin, you know, admin privileges, users and then if you ever work for a company or whatever then there are different names for other people like sales people managers all this stuff and if you're using a web application to do whatever business typically that business has separated responsibilities depending on what role you have in that company standard stuff let's look at this real quick in here we have our basic web page let's say and we have two pages dedicated for the admin and two pages dedicated for the user but my admin is special. My admin has access to everything in the program, which means that for these two pages, the admin will have access to it as well. But because um, he's a user is just a user, they don't have access back to the admin page. So the admin can look at all four pages. The user can only look at these pages. But it can get more complicated than this. Imagine if I have, you know, just a bunch of uh, a bunch of pages going for the user. Take a few pages here. And I want the admin, you know, the admin's fine. The admin has access to all, everything, but, you know, oh, oh, whatever, that's fine. But let's say the user is not enough. Uh, the admin doing a bunch of stuff for the user as well is getting a little, you know, it's causing too much trouble. So we're just going to have another role and call this role the manager. The manager has access to, uh, let's see, I'll make him blue. Yeah. So the manager has access to portions of the use of this user page that users don't normally have access to. So let's say it allows them to change a price or something for, you know, for some product or whatever. They can do that and have access to all four pages like the admin does. The admin also can do that because the admin has access to everything. But the users can only access the user pages, but not that functionality that the manager has. Let's say that they're in these two pages. So that means that we have to add a new role. So you have a new role, you have a new manager role right here. And now we have all this going on for it. That's all well and good. But that means we have to manually put in this manager role everywhere. So where the users are here, here. And here, and here, this manager role has to go here and here. So they have access to the same level of, oh, they have the same level of access as the users plus extra, essentially. And then obviously the admin has access to everything else. 
I'm just going to put it out there for convenience sake. But let's say we need more. We need uh, another rule. Now, this isn't an admin. This is the HR department. So the HR has access to this and this. And it also has access to, and then obviously the admin has access to it. But you know what? There are portions of the user where I would like the HR to have access to stuff. So we're just going to add the HR in here somewhere. And now they have access to all the user pages as well because they have special privileges here as well. So do you know what I'm doing? Like, I know this is a very long way of going uh, to, to try to get into this topic. But what's happening here is that every time you keep adding a role, you have to go back into the program in order to add that role manually. So that's the issue with roles in general is that you have to basically keep track of everything. And if you have new roles coming in that have similar privileges to, let's say, you know, the manager or whatever, then you still have to write that in wherever all the manager places are and then make sure that the HR and the manager have like the same uh, privilege level. And then if the HR is more privilege, privilege level, then, you know, you have to keep in mind, you have to do that. So you have to go out of your way in order to add that manually in every single case. And that is the problem with roles, essentially in a nutshell. Now, let's add another feature into the roles. Let's say that, probably shouldn't have deleted all that, but let's say I have a user page here. And let's say that I'm I'm selling stuff online, right? So I have, you know, user page one, two, and uh, we have user page three. Make it red or something. But in this page, we're selling people things, right? So you're and here we're selling I don't know uh, food. We're selling here some other stuff. I don't know, phones, but here. We're going to be selling a little something spicier, some 18 plus stuff. I don't know. You're saying liquor or something. I can't exactly sell all this stuff to every user that there is. Maybe there are some users who are not 18 or have some laws that I have to follow that says I have to make sure, you know, do my best that I can to only allow people who are 18 or older um, into this page. Or else, you know, we get legal liabilities and stuff like that. Or, you know, we might be selling something illegally to someone who shouldn't be buying. And you can't do that with roles either. You have to go one step beyond. And that's where the policies come in. I think I said that before. Policies are basically um, a catch-all and can take the place of a role because they have roles within them. They could have logic within them and they could have claims within them. And that's why it's usually best practice to have policies because not only that, uh, you only have to change one place in order to change a policy. So let's say if I ran into that scenario where I have, um, you know, this user scenario and and these are the user privileges. Every user has these privileges, but now I need to have this extra bit of logic here. Um, in order to make this change with a policy, there is only one place in the code I have to do this is where I write the um, the actual ad policy stuff for it. So you'll see that when we get into the technical things. But take my word for it, there's only one place where you're going to be writing the policy itself. So in that policy, you could actually have logic. You could actually have the claims and the roles here. So what you're going to do is you're going to just put in the role that you want, which in this case is user. And then you're going to add like a function or whatever that says only users that are over 18 um, depending on their date of birth. So you do the date of birth thing and then you, you know, subtract it from today's date, blah, blah, blah. You do all that. You get whether or not they're 18. So then that's part of the policy. And then you only have to change it in one place. So you don't have to go back and do all of this. Um, yeah. So in fact, you might make another policy. Uh, you won't do it to like the user role. You would just make it the, uh, 18 plus policy instead and if you need to make changes to the user itself for whatever reason you want all users to have this you can make a user policy to also do this so instead of so instead of um oh my goodness
So instead of having the user role being the main thing that you're going to demarcate the pages with, you're using a user policy. So the user policy might just have the one role in there. But later on, if you want to make changes to all users, you can do that in one place instead of going and finding every place that you've uh, designated the user to have access to. And same with anything else. So that leads us to our next thing. You could also have claims in these policies as well. And what is a claim? The claim is actually how we give the users their privileges in the first place. So in when you create a user in the authentication step, that's where all that happens. You give the user a claim. So that claim can have whatever. So normally, um, by default, I believe you give them a default claim uh, in the program. However, you can designate whatever you want in the claim. So by making you know an admin manager kind of page, you can give them whatever role you want. So in one case, I say I want the user to be an admin. I can give them an admin claim and have their role to be admin. I could give them an HR claim or just a normal user claim, a default user. And all that is, is that in your database, you're going to have two uh, key value pair. A key value pair is basically, you know, a dictionary. So your key is going to be your role in this case, and your value is going to be admin. That is the most basic way of doing this. Now you can make it more complex by having more data in your claim. So in the example I did before, where you wanted to know the date of birth, you can actually have that in the claim DOB, and then have whatever the um, date of birth of your user is going to be. You can even have more roles in there. So you doesn't have to be a role admin. You could just, you, you, it doesn't matter what these names are. It doesn't matter what the key value pair is, as long as your program is able to meaningfully recognize what it wants. So if I want to do role one admin, role two something, role three, whatever, it doesn't really matter. As long as your program can read it, you can demarcate it however you want. So you could also have those very claims uh, either be the policy, uh, be the way that your program is based on um, basing its authorization. But again, I would just stick with the policy to do all that. Uh, it saves a lot of time and a lot of headaches in the future. But if you're just making some simple stuff that you know you're not going to get overly complex, then you can get away with either using a role or a claims. It really doesn't matter. And I believe that is the basis of our authentication, our authorization pieces. So after all of this, you might get into something more technical. And the reason why I say um, to go back to the claim stuff, the reason why I say claims are the most important is because claims is also how we're going to handle um, other authentication and authorization schemes like OAuth 2, aka if you were going to use um, your Gmail account or some other account in order to get the claims from them or uh, in order to authenticate a user, you can use those accounts. You're still going to be using claims. Excuse me. So in that case, uh, understanding how claims works is really important. My recommendation is to usually use the policy. This saves you time in the future, especially when you're making a big growing application. And obviously, if you still want some more information on claims, don't worry. I'll get into it. Technically, you that will probably clear up any confusion you might have. Just know that all it is is just a key value pair. You have a name of whatever the property is going to be, and then you have the value of the property that you're going to read off of. That will be interpreted by your program, and then that is what will give it all this stuff here. So your policy is how you actually, your policy or your roles is how you separate your program. You can do it with your claims as well, but I don't recommend it. I recommend it doing through the policy. And then the claims is how you actually designate the user with their privileges. That's all there is to it. In a nutshell, authentication and authorization is not hard to understand, but understanding the relationship between them can get a little daunting, especially if you go on the Microsoft Docs. They, they go crazy trying to just tell you what I've told you here. But all you have to know is that there are three ways of doing it uh, to separate your code, how to authorize people. And then when you authenticate them, they're given a claim. Either you see it or you don't see it, but this claim tells you exactly what the privileges of that person are going to be. And that's all there is to it, at least within ASP.NET Core Identity API. There are other schemes out there, but we're not going to be focusing on that. And that's it. Hopefully, I didn't go too fast for you guys, but uh, these are the main concepts that you want to know. 
and that's it i guess uh, i don't know how to end the video so i'll see you in the tech video